So, uh, today we're going to talk about something new. We are, we're done with the modeling part. If you, uh, if you, if you review uh, what we have said so far uh, from the beginning of the course until this point, uh, we started with a quick discussion of the relational model. Uh, then we uh, dive into the details of ER and how do we convert ER to uh, your relational design. So with all that discussion, you guys should be uh, comfortable with coming up with a database design whenever you are presented with a description of what you don't want. So as you have seen from your homework one, and as you know, you will see quickly also in your project phase one. Okay. So now the design phase is done. Now you have your tables created in your database system, uh, which you know. You will be practicing that uh, in the as part of your phase one, okay? uh, where you are given access to the database server. So not only you need to uh, document the design of your schema uh, on a piece of paper, you will actually go ahead and create tables in that database server. Okay? Now you have your database design, and you have now assuming also you have some data populated into your tables. The next thing, of course, is to be able to retrieve data according to different user requests. In other words, you need to send database queries to uh, retrieve data uh, per different user requests. And we can achieve that by using SQL, Structured Query Language. Uh, we have seen a bit of that discussion already. But today, before we dive into the detail of SQL, I want to present to you the theoretical foundation for the design of SQL. And understanding this is really critical because only after understanding this, you will be able to get really good at SQL, writing SQL. So, so the theoretical foundation is what we call the relational algebra. Okay. Relational algebra is a form of a query language which allows manipulation and retrieval of data from a database. Okay. Relational model, the design of relational model, make it possible to, to, to design simple and powerful uh, query languages. Okay? There are some strong theoretical foundations based on uh, logic, which I'm not going to go to uh, detail of that, because that's very theoretical in nature. And I don't want to you know, drag you, all of you into that theoretical aspect of the design of a query language. But one thing I do want to point out is query language is not the same as programming language. Programming language means, you know, C++, Java, JavaScript, and those languages you, you've been using in, in your coding practice. For one thing, query language is not expected to be Turing complete. Language is not Turing complete. Okay. And it's not intended to, to be used for complex calculation. For example, you want to find a TSP solution. Yeah, what's TSP? Traveling salesman problem. Okay, I'll give you a few uh, locations. As a salesperson, you need to travel through those points using the shortest total distance. Sounds like a really simple problem, but actually it's empty loss. Meaning that there are no polynomial algorithms to solve that problem. Okay? Uh, that being said, query language is supposed to be easy and support efficient access to large data sets. So here is a slide dedicated to uh, Turing Complete, but I'm not going to go over the detail of this. If you're interested, you can read this yourself. There are two forms of uh, uh, relational query language. One is relational algebra, which is more operational. You will understand the meaning of operational in a minute once we see a few examples of what relational algebra looks like. Then there's another class of uh, relational query language called relational calculus. Uh, which I decide to skip uh, for the interest of time. We will not be discussing that in this class. Okay? So we'll be focusing on relational algebra. Some preliminary background. A query is applied to relational instances. Okay? Relational instances. And the result of a query is also a relational instance. Schema of input relations for a query is fixed. Once you specify your query, 
the schema of those input relations are fixed. For example, if you want to select the name of student from the student schema, by the time you write down your query, the input schema is fixed, is the schema of the student relation. Okay? And what's more important, the schema of the result of a given query is also fixed, meaning that if you are defining a relational query against a one or more relational instances as the input, at the time of when you specify that query, the output schema is automatically fixed as well. It is determined, the output schema is determined by the definition of the query language construct as well as your input schemas. Okay? And lastly, I want to, before I dive into the detail, I want to uh, point out there are two conventions for a user to refer to a particular attribute from a relational schema. One is called the positional uh, reference, the other is called the name field notation. So what does that mean? Meaning, okay, let's, let's imagine we have a student schema that has four attributes, student ID, name, login, and age. The name field notation is easy, right? You say student.name, that refers to the name attribute from the student schema. The positional reference refers to the, the method that you refer to a particular attribute from a schema using its position information. For example, the second attribute of a student schema is name. Does that make sense? You may wonder why we need the positional reference when obviously the name field notation is much more intuitive. Okay? The reason for that is when you are querying multiple tables, okay, multiple schemas, they may actually contain attributes of the same name. For example, student has a name attribute. The employee may have a name attribute as well. If you just say simply say name, it may present ambiguity to your query, right? But using positional information, you can distinguish different attributes without any ambiguity involved. But that's the fundamental reason why we want to have a positional way of referencing an attribute as well. So, relational algebra. Relational algebra, on the first look, is really simple. It has only five operators. You only need to understand five operators, that's it. Okay? These are the five operators. Selection, projection, cross product, set difference, and union. Selection, written as a Greek letter sigma, projection, the Greek letter pi, cross product is just the cross, set difference is minus, and union is that union operator. Okay? And each operation, the, the key observation is, since each operator, as I mentioned before, take a relational instance as input and return a relational instance as output. This particular fact means that you can compose these operators in arbitrary fashion to build more complex operations out of them. Does that make sense? In other words, the operations are closed. So when I say operation is closed, what do I mean by that? Let me illustrate this using the field of integer. Let's say I have a field of integers, meaning that I define my operation with respect to uh, the field of integers. For example, class is the operation I define with respect to the field of integer. I take two integers, I will produce another integer. A, B, and C must be integers. And because of this, I can compose this Meaning that I can do this. Because a plus operation expects two integers as input. This is an integer. The output of this is another integer denoted by C, for example. So I can compose that without any issue. <coughs> but if you think about the division operator, okay? Now, with respect to the field of integers, with respect to the, to the field of floating numbers, division is still fine. But with respect to the field of integers, division might give you troubles. Okay? 
For example, I can do division of 7 divided by 3. Okay? The output of this is no longer a integer. So if you define plus with respect to only the field of integers, this is no longer well defined. I don't know what to do with it because I, I'm expecting integer as my input. You're giving me a non-integer value as input. I don't know what to do. Of course, you say, okay, in reality, this makes sense too, right? How can, I, how can you claim this is invalid? That's because you extend the definition of plus beyond the field of integer, you extend it to natural numbers, floating numbers. That's why it works. But if it's only defined with respect to the field of integer, this doesn't make sense anymore. So the operation is no longer closed. Okay? In the context of relational algebra operators, we don't have this issue because each operator takes one or two relational instances as its input and will produce one relational instance as its output. So you can always compose them in arbitrary fashions because all operations are closed with respect to the field of relational instance. Okay? Now let me dive into the details of these different operations. And before I do that, I'm going to show you a bunch of running examples we'll be using throughout our discussion. We're going to use this simple sailor club setup, right? We have sailors, we have boats, and we have reserve, showing which sailor reserve which boat. Okay? And for sailors, I'm going to have two different instances. They're the same schema, but I just want to demonstrate different scenarios by using two different instances of the same schema. Another note is that the primary key for the reserve table is sale ID, bold ID, and date together. All three of them serve as your primary key. Uh, what's the implication of that? What's, in, in particular, what's the difference between that design and if I simply use this as my primary key? Can someone tell me the difference? What's the difference between this and that? Go ahead. Yeah. So if you're just using say ID and bold ID, then like they have reserved in forever, right? Because the date makes it specific. They have reserved forever. Uh, well, I still have the date information, right? Meaning that this sitter still just reserved this boat on this particular day. It doesn't mean it reserved he or she reserved this forever. Right? They can only reserve one boat a day. They only reserve one boat a day. They only reserve one boat a day. No, that's not true. I can have sailor A reserve boat one, two, three, sailor A reserve boat, boat one, two, four on the same day. That's totally fine. What's wrong with it? Go ahead. They can never reserve that boat again. They can only reserve the same boat once. That's it. Using that design, you can reserve the same boat multiple times on different days. Okay? That's the key difference. However, in this design, you can reserve the same boat multiple times on different dates, but for the same date, you can reserve that boat only once. Okay? All right. Now let's start with projection. Projection, the semantics of projection is as follows. You basically, as the name has suggested, you project out one or multiple columns or attributes. Column and attribute are referring to the same concept. Okay? You project out one or more columns or attributes from the input schema, from the input schema. So the notation is the Greek letter pi with the subscript being a list of attributes you want to project out separated by comma, if you have more than one attribute to be projected out, okay? So for example, project out age of S2, mean that particular query means that you want to find out all the age values from the sailor 2 instance. 
for the age comma rating from S2 means that you want to find out the age and rating values from the Sailor 2 instance. Okay? Sounds like fairly trivial, right? But there is a uh, but there is a catch. What's the catch? The catch is going back to the earlier point I was making. A relational algebra operator needs to take a relational instance as input and produce a relational instance as output. What's a fundamental requirement for a relational instance? What's the fundamental requirement for being a relational instance? Can you have duplicates? Can you have duplicated records in a relational instance? How many say, yes, you can have duplicated records in a relational instance? How many say, no, you cannot have duplicate? OK, good. I feel like my effort wasn't wasted. OK, relational instance must have no duplicated records. In the definition of relational model. Okay? In the definition of relational model. But projection gave you troubles. Let me illustrate that using this example. Okay? If I put out the age, if I put out name and rating, okay, in this case, I got this output. Which is fine, there are no duplicates. There are no duplicated record. By the way, when I say duplicate record, I mean duplicate the entire row. If you have duplication on a particular column, and you have multiple columns in a record, that's OK. What if I put out H? What should be the output? The H column, of course. But for our discussion just now, what will happen? Yeah, exactly. It will give you this. To re you know, you have to eliminate duplicate records. Of course, in this case, duplicate record and duplicate values are the same thing because you only have a single column for each record. Okay. By the way, I also want to use this example to show you to explain the earlier point I was making, which is once you have a relational query. Example: This is the the, simple, the simplest relational query you can think of. The input schema is fixed. The input schema in this case is the Sailor's schema. And the output schema is fixed as well. What's the output schema? In the age column by itself. What's the output schema for the query down below? Name and rating. Now the next question comes naturally after seeing this example is, how do you eliminate duplicates? How do you go from 35, 55, 35, 35 to 35, 55? You may wonder, is it not simple? Looking at this, you got 35, 55. That's because you only have four records. Imagine you are Google, you have four billion records. If you tell me you two, you I can look through four billion records and find out duplicates in a short amount of time, you are somebody, okay? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> no kidding. Next time we run general election, you should run for the chief officer for duplicate vote detection. Okay? It's not trivial, okay? It's not trivial. How do you eliminate duplicates? You know? Can someone propose an algorithm for me? Go ahead. I would query. Some, like a combine and make a super key. Like no, no. I'm asking how to wait. Very simple. Let me describe the problem first. Forget about database. Forget about relational models. The problem is very simple. You have a market fund. Mathematically, there's a difference between a set and a market set. Can someone tell me what's the difference of the two? What's the definition of a set? What's the definition of a market set? The difference is a set is a collection of distinct elements. A market set is a collection of elements 
that potentially have duplicates. So this is a set. Uh, this is a bar test set. Okay, that's the difference. Okay. So duplicate duplicate elimination is essentially to go from here to here. How do you, how do you do that? Okay, that's what we're trying to do. Go ahead. You have some suggestion? So like you can add those elements in the multi set. Try to add the link to the set, and then like uh, when you like during that iteration, you. Oh, by the way, you don't have this. Okay. You don't know what's this. You you go is to produce this. By the way. You have this. Sorry, if you add, add up the values, how, why does it help? I don't see why I it helps. I just add the elements in the multi set. Okay. Like, uh, add to the set, and then and then I check if if the next element is, is in that set. Okay. Do you, you you're saying you start with the empty set, then you start adding this element here, see whether it started here. Yeah. Okay. Then you do this. Okay. But the question is, how do you check if three already this isn't that the same problem as what I said, looking through this set using your eye. It's the same thing. How do you check somebody something is already in that set? You can sort it and then just have a okay. current element. And then okay. based on your current element, you can just keep comparing. Once it's different, you just change your current element and just remove any duplicates that way. Let me use this as A. You sort this A, which produce. Okay, what's the sorting cost? Uh, log, log. <coughs> log in. Then after that, you take a linear pass, linear scan over this. Now you keep one one running counter. You remember three. You see the next value the same as this. You cross over. If it's different, you update this running counter to five. Keep it running counter up to seven. Cross. You're done. So the total cost is n log n plus a linear cost. In big O notation, it's dominated by n log n, so the total cost is n log n. Okay, that's how you eliminate duplicates. Uh, however, this is very expensive. N log n, I mean, n log n is, is affordable. Anything that's, that's not quadratic, like n squared, n log n is affordable, but it's not cheap either. Right? So you don't want to pay this cost. In practice, henceforth, let me finish. Then I take your questions. In real database systems, in commercial database systems, the implementation of projection by default, they do not remove duplicates for that reason, because it's fairly expensive to do this. So, relational algebra being a theoretical foundation language, we don't really care about efficiency when we talk about this. That's why in relational algebra context, projection always remove duplicates. But in a practical scenario using SQL, projection by default does not remove duplicates. There are ways to enforce duplicate elimination in SQL, which I will be I will talk about that later on. I have a question somewhere. Uh, what I said is clarify it off. Okay. Alright, that's projection. Let's look at selection. Projection allow you to select columns. Okay? Naturally, the next operation allows you to select rows. That's what selection does. The syntax of selection is Greek letter sigma. The subscript will be a Boolean. Followed by the input schema. That's it. Okay. Give you an example. I want to select all those greater greater than a. This must be a boolean expression. A boolean expression. Okay. <coughs> the output will be: you eliminate the rows who do not satisfy the condition. And here, I want to demonstrate the concept I said earlier. Because the output of this is a relational instance, which can be used 
as an input to the next relational algebra operator, like a production. So you can compose them to get more complicated queries out of it. So you get this all. Okay, now let me backtrack a little bit. If I just talk about selection, do I need to worry about duplicate elimination? Some of you say no. Can you argue why? Why we don't have to worry about duplicate elimination? It should already be duplicate free. Or, or more rigorously speaking, a subset of sets must be duplicate free. A set, as I defined just now, is duplicate free. No duplicates. If you start with something that's duplicate free and you choose a subset of it, how can you introduce duplicates in the process? Impossible. You start with a collection of dollar bills. One dollar, five dollar, ten dollar, twenty dollar, hundred dollar. Are there bills larger than hundred dollar? Have you seen one? You start with a collection of dollar bills with no duplicates. And as you select a few dollar bills out of it, if you tell me if magically you can introduce duplicate in this process, I want to hire you to work for me. <laughs> Seriously. If you can do that, let me know. We go do some business together. <laughs> because you start with a set. But if I give you a collection of dollar bills that are that have duplicates to begin with, uh, more than one one dollar bill, more than one ten dollar bill, more than one twenty dollar bill, more than one hundred dollar bill, they ask you to select a subset of it. You come back and say, "Oh, I say I got duplicate one dollar bill, duplicate ten dollar bill." No, that's not good enough to work for me. That's just normal, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Meaning that a subset of multi set may have duplicates. But a subset of set must be duplicate. Right? Yeah, that's why you don't have to worry about duplicate elimination for selection. But at this final step, when you do production, now you need to worry about duplicate elimination. Potentially, you may have duplicates because of the production operation. Okay? Now, what about union and set difference? So far, we are looking at unary operators. Unary operators refer to those operators that take only one instance as its input. But there are times where you need to take more than one relational instance as input. Things force will introduce union and set difference. All these operations take two input relations, which must be Union compatible. What do I mean by union compatible? Intuitively speaking, what it said is the following. If you're talking about a set of animals, you have a set of animals here, you have another set of animals. You have a set of animals from Africa, you have a set of animals from Europe. You union them, you still get a set of animals. That makes sense. You have a set of animals from Africa, you have a set of star from galaxy. Union them. That doesn't make sense. What do you get? You got a spaghetti out of it. I'm not a big fan of spaghetti, by the way, but that's what you get. That makes sense? So union compatible, intuitively speaking, means that the two relational instances you apply the union or set different operator over must be of the same type, meaning that they must, or, or rigorously speaking, in the context of relational model, they must have the same schema in order for you to union or difference that. Okay? Same schema means same number of fields and corresponding fields must have the same type. That's a formal definition of same schema. For which, if any, duplicate, duplicate elimination is required. Why? <clears throat> so 
you said union, you need to worry about duplicate elimination. What about set difference? Do you need to worry about duplicate elimination for that? No? Okay. Why? Can you argue why? In set difference? Or so in set difference, I don't think you have duplicate duplicate because you eliminate the difference, right? Uh, kind of. That's kind of like a hard waving argument. I need a more formal argument. More formally, what, what you want to argue the following. For union, A union B, what do they do? They Take two set A and B. When you union, you produce everything from this two part as well as this part. This is where you potentially have duplicates. But of course, if you two sets start with this, then union them together, you don't have duplicates, but you don't know. You have to check which is the case. What about set difference? If you do A minus B, set difference tells you that you are selecting this part. Which naturally means that A minus B must be a subset of A. Per our earlier argument, a subset of set must be duplicate free. That's why you don't have to worry about duplicate elimination here. Fundamentally, sub a uh, set different give you a subset of set. In sports, you don't have to worry about duplicate. Another observation from this discussion is that union operator has this so-called associative property, meaning that the order you apply the two to the operator doesn't matter. But set difference is not. This is not the same as this, which will give you ah, they're different. The ordering of the two maps. Okay? You may wonder, some of you may wonder, okay, we have set union, we have set difference. What about set intersection? Isn't that a fundamental operator as well? Why that's not part of relational algebra? That's when relation algebra becomes really interesting. The five operators are what we call the basic operators. Using these five basic operators, you can produce more complex operations. Pretty much like you look at the life on Earth, life can be as complex as it won't be, but it starts with what? The formation of life in Earth, as we know, only need two things. Water and Energy. carbon, right? You need those to form complex life, right? So similarly, we only need the five basic operators, but with those five basic operators, we can do super complex things. And I will demonstrate this using intersection as an example. Right? Intersection typically is written as <coughs> and we don't have this operator. Okay? So you cannot write it like this because we don't have this. But it basically means that I'm trying to get this part. So how do you get this part? Go ahead. A union B minus? I mean, like, no set minus A union B. Who minus A union B? Uh, like, empty set. Huh? Empty set. So you are saying this? Yeah. Okay, let's think about it. A union B give you the whole thing. Empty minus that, what do you get? I mean, you are saying what's outside the universe. Nobody knows the answer to that. <laughs> right? That's essentially what we are saying. What's outside the universe? I don't know. It's not well defined. Go ahead. Uh, would it be A union B minus A minus B, but in parentheses, the, so in the parentheses, yeah. like that? And then minus B minus A? Uh, I don't want to go down that, it's too complicated. It might be right, but it's, from this construction so far, it doesn't sound right. Because what you got, A union B is the whole thing, A minus B is this part, you minus the way that what you got is, is essentially B. You just got B back. 
Yes. Why, why are you complicated? Okay. If that's what you want, just write B. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, let, let me give you another tab. B, yeah? What do you want? Minus so what you, what you have said so far is just B. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The whole thing, right? Oh. And what do you, what do you, where do you go from here? Go over there? B minus, B minus A. B minus, okay. B minus B minus A. Let's look at this together. B is this whole thing, right? What's B minus A? This part. B minus B minus will give you this. Okay? Of course, a symmetric construction is what? Can you draw us? By the way, this is not a arithmetic operation. You cannot cancel this like, oh, B minus plus A, this will be A. It's not a arithmetic operation, okay? <coughs> okay, that's intersection. And this demonstrates to you that you can construct more complex operators using basic operators. The last operator is cross product. Cross product take two schemas and glue them together. That's it. Now append one schema to another. And in the process of this, in the process of doing this, you produce all possible pairs for all records from the two input relational instances. What do I mean by that? Is that you have R and S to relational instance at input, and they may have multiple attributes. But I'm going to uh, ignore those details. I will just represent record using a single symbol. That doesn't necessarily mean it has only a single attribute. Each symbol here, each symbol here represents a complete record, which may have one or more attributes. Okay? One, two, three are symbol as well. If you cross part out the two, Reduce the effort I need to do. What you get is so that's the cross product of the two. Okay? You glue the schema together, and then you produce all possible pairs between the input records of the two relational instances. That's it. That's a cross product. Okay? And in the, you know, in the definition of cross product, you may produce, uh, you know, if you look at the output of this, you may have duplicate names for your attributes. For example, if you cross product sailors with reserve, what do you get? You have two sailor ID columns. One sailor ID from the sailors, one sailor ID from the reserve table. If you do nothing about it, you end up with a schema with ambiguity, with two SID columns. When I say sailors cross reserve dot SID, which SID are you talking about? Because I have now I have two SID columns. You see the challenge? Yes? To deal with this, we introduce another operator. This is not a relational algebra operator, but it's a facility facilitating operator. It's not a relational algebra operator, but it's a facilitating operator called the renaming operator. The renaming operator written as row take a relational algebra query as its second term. Okay, take a relational algebra query as the as the second term, <coughs> and you rename this to. Name of the output instance. Okay? Which is also the output schema. Name of the output schema. So you name the whole thing as C, for example. So I rename this R cross S 
as C. Okay, now this is my R cross S. Reserve or actually reserve cross. So R means reserves, S means sailor. Uh, to be consistent with what I have there, I will do. Okay, this is, I will do R S cross. I will put sailors first, then reserve second. Okay, sailor and reserve. Now sailor has four attributes, right? Reserve has three attributes. So in total, you have eight attributes in the output schema. You follow me? And I will rename the first column to SID1. The first column is the first column from the S sales table, which is SID. So I rename that SID to SID1. I rename the fifth column to SID2. What's the fifth column in the output? Well, I have four attributes from the sailors. The fifth column is the first column from the reserve, which is the sail ID from the reserve. So that second sail ID column now is being renamed to SID2. What about the other attributes? Well, if, if you're not renaming the other attributes, the other attributes inherit whatever the original name they have from the input relational schema. OK? That's the renaming operator. So this is the output. Using that renaming operator, this whole thing is called C, and this will be SID1, this will be SID2. OK? Questions? So compound operations. So those are the basics. Now let's discuss some more interesting stuff. The basic ones are really straightforward to understand. Now let's talk about some more interesting operations. Intersection, we talked about it already. So I'm going to skip this. By the way, intersection, you don't have to worry about duplicates, right? Because intersection, is a subset of R as well as a subset of S. So it's a subset of set, so it must be duplicate free. So you don't have to worry about duplicate in that case. Uh, I was just curious on the cross product example. Is yes. there not a way to merge the, SS, the SID and then keep the rest of the information? There are ways, of course. You can. You know, if you want to, you can put that out, put that away one at the keep just one if you want to. But I'm talking about just the cross product itself. The definition of cross product is this, just like this. Okay. Now the next compound operation I'm gonna introduce is called the join operation. <coughs> The join operation, okay? The join operation, the first join operator I'm going to introduce is called the natural join. The natural join is written as like two triangle flip 90 degree and put them together. Okay? So R natural join S. What does this mean? What does this operation mean? What does this mean? Okay? It basically means the following. You compute R cross S first, then you select the rows where attributes of the appearing both relations have equal values. Put that all unique attributes and one copy of each of the common ones. So what to translate that to relational algebra, what it means is the following. First of all, you, you compute R cross S. Okay? Then you do a selection. Over this, the selection is R dot A1 equal to S dot B1 and R dot A2 equal to S dot B2, so on and so forth, for all AI and BI, where AI is from R, BI from S, such that AI and B I refer to the same type of attribute of oh, same type here means that they have the same semantic meaning. For example, 
they both refer to sailor ID. They both refer to sailor name. Do you follow me? And you do this for all such common attributes. Okay, that's the selection. And what about after this? You put that out or other attributes from R and S. All other attributes, meaning not these guys, all the other ones. And you put that out either all the A's or all the B's. You put out because these are having common values. So you keep just one copy of this. That's an This is, doesn't matter which one you put out, all the AIs or all the BIs. You keep one copy of the common values. That's it. Let me illustrate this using an example. Okay, so what are the A and B here? What are the common attributes? Can someone tell me in this case? You only have one A and one B, which is SID. That's the only common attribute for the two relations. So you do the cross product, which is this. And for the common attributes, you find those with equal values on common attributes. So this one, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one, and this one. So only these two records satisfy you the selection condition. Okay? And what do you do in the, in the final step? You put out all attributes, meaning as name, grading, age, BID, and date. You put out all other attributes plus one copy of the common attributes, which is either this or this. So you got oh, this as all. Okay? Natural job. Any question on natural job? Good? Question? I um, just noticed that the lever got just eliminated. What? Thirty-one, lever, nice one. Can you? No, I don't. I don't follow you. Which got you in it? Don't you want to keep that information for lover? Uh, lover. No, no, I don't. By definition, natural drawn, I don't. Natural drawn basically is to link records from different tables. If there are no reservations for lover, why I want to keep that around in my output? That's by definition, natural. That's exactly the record I want to get rid of. Okay? Do all of you follow what Natural Drawn does? Intuitively, what Natural Drawn does is to take two tables and link up the records, the corresponding tables from the two tables, if there's a the foreign key and the primary key relationship, in some sense. Of course, the common attributes, sorry, the common attribute may not happen just for primary key, foreign key. It could be a name column. All right, so that's the natural join example. Uh, there are other type of join called theta join. Theta join, okay? Or theta join. Theta join written as this is called theta join. Also known as condition join. Meaning that you are joining the two tables subject to a condition C. This is a condition in Boolean 1. Okay? Your, and the definition of this is actually fairly easy to understand. It's simply selection of this condition over R cross S. That's it. Okay? You follow what I'm saying? For example, I can do a theta join like this. SID lesson SID. Theta to SID lesson with those SID. I want to link the two tables together using this condition. Why I get these results? Let's go back to the cross product. That's my cross product, right? Then I simply apply my condition. My condition in this case is theta 
So as I did, was less, uh, less uh, or less than equal to the example I used? Just less than. Just less than, okay. Good. Reserve. So as I did. Okay, that's my condition. Let's check this condition against this cross product result. Is this to be kept? No? What about this? Yes? What about this? No? What about this? Yes? No, no. So the output will be this and this. This two right. Oh, sorry. This and this. This two right. The second and the fourth record. Yes. Okay. So you get this as the output. Okay. Questions. The schema, by the way, the schema of natural join. The schema of natural join is not is not the same. The schema of this is not the same as the cross product because you are eliminating duplicate columns in this process. You follow what I'm saying? Those common attributes you keep only one copy of it. However, the schema of the cross product, oh, sorry, sorry, the schema of the condition join, theta join, will be identical to the cross product. But you are only doing a selection. Selection will not change the schema of the input. Okay? So one final subtle observation, which is the following, which is all of you followed the discussion so far. Okay? <coughs> so the next discussion is, is the following two equivalent? Okay, I can use any Boolean expression as my condition. I can use any Boolean expression as my condition, right? In a theta join. Follow the argument? So, if I use equivalence condition, if I use equivalence condition over there, on common attributes of the two tables, will that give me natural join? In other words, example, sailors. Condition join with reserve with the condition that sailors dot SID equal to reserve dot SID. Is this the same as simply sailors natural join reserve? Are, are the two the same? You're saying no? Can you explain why? The result of the theta join still has the column, the second column. The result, I mean, they're almost the same, except that the schema of this would have that second column as ID, but the schema of this would not have the second column as ID. To make that the same, you have to add a projection over this. I would say plus one theta ID. That will make it equivalent. Okay? Uh, the next operator is, if you think so far it's complicated, the next operator will dwarf all the things we discussed so far. Okay? It's like putting moon to next to, to give me a big, uh, not Mars. Mars is small, right? No Mars. <laughs> A big, big, whatever star, okay? Not as big as sun, it's not, the difference in difficulty is not that dramatic, but you get the point, okay? The next operator is called the division operator. And before I start, uh, I'll give you, before I present the, the semantic meaning of division, I'll give you some uh, intuitive examples to help you understand the usefulness of this operator, the usefulness of this operator. Imagine I have a single, I have a really, really simple schema. Really simple database. I have student number and program number. Pretty much like what you're doing now, signing up on my Google Sheet. Which tell me which student work on which product. Or which student works in which team, right? Okay. The difference is, in our case, each student signed up for just one team. In this case, a student may work for multiple projects. That's a, that's, a, that's a key difference, I think. 
But otherwise, it's, uh, it's exactly the same. Student number, project number, which tells you which student works in which project. A student may work for multiple project, a project may have multiple students work for that. So it's a manage manage between student and project. In other words, in other words what this is the result of And there's a student number here, and the further number here. The bunch of other attributes I don't really care, these are the keys. And uh, as a result of this manage many, this will produce a table like that. For that relationship set. Okay? You follow the discussion? Okay? Alright. By the way, if you don't understand what I'm saying here, you need to carefully review. ER, ER2 relation model before you get started on your homework one. So that's what we have. And my, my, my question is really simple. Okay, you, you tell me student work with which product, fantastic. I want to know, okay, very simple. Who work on product two? Who work on product two? You say that's easy, right? I will select. Well, I denote this relation as A, by the way. So what I will do is, okay, you say you want to select who work on product two, right? I say select from A where product number is equal to P2. Then I product out all those student numbers. That's it. You follow the argument? I say fine, okay, you can do that. Who work on product two and product three and product four? What do you have to do? Say okay, or right? You use or you don't use and by the way. You use and oh uh, okay. Let's say I want to find okay. Let me change my sign to and meaning that I want to find all those who work on all products. The same person working on all three products, but I need to use and not all. You follow my argument here? Seems like you can solve this problem using this combination of selection and production, right? Seems like. But what if this is not product number, this is like part number. And S is like a, a final product. F16, or whatever time, or car. Use which part? And each of those guys use millions of parts. You follow what I'm saying? And ask you, okay, which car use part number one, part number two, until part number a million? You say, okay, I can solve this problem using this selection production expression. Yes, but you need to write a million conditions over there. Do you follow my argument? Yes or no? I don't know about you, I'm not willing to do that. I can spend my time I can better use my time. And I'm writing down a million equality condition in a blink. Right? That's insane. I don't want to do that. But that's what you are forced to do with this particular construction. Do you follow the discussion? So, division is to help you. Division is here to help you. Division says, okay, you can do that without using this complex contract construction of potentially Meanings of equality conditions. What you do is you simply write A divided by an instance of that product number or part number you are interested in. So B1 here is all the products you are interested to query for, like who work for that product or that set of products. A divided by B1 will give you all those who work for product B1. A divided by B2 will give you all those who work for product B2, a P2, and P4. And A divided by B3 will magically give you all those who work for all three of them. I don't have another example, but if, what if I have another uh, using this as an example, right? What's the answer of the following? If I have, if I have a B4, 
P1, P2, and I do A divided by B4. What's the output of this? Can someone tell me that? Uh, I want somebody else to answer. Have you answered my question today? Not today. Okay, go ahead. S1. S1. Can you explain why? Uh, your reasoning is right, but you also wrong. You said S1 works for each of those product, but S1 actually does not work for product 3. And product. Oh, actually, S1 does. So, yes. The answer is S1. Okay. Well, but let me change this to. Okay, now what's the answer? Can you tell me? <laughs> okay. That's Nobody works for all products. I was thinking about that. I, I, I forgot about the fact S1 working for our project. Okay. <clears throat> okay? So that's the semantic meaning of this division operator. Now let's rewind back and look at how we actually construct this operation using those five basic operators selection, production, cross product, set, difference, and union. Using those, I can magically express this. How do I do that? Okay. And in order to do that, we first need to understand what exactly is division. When I write A divided by B, what exactly does that mean? Semantically, what does this mean? OK, I'm going to write it down, OK? See whether you guys can follow me. You are finding all those x. You're finding a set, obviously. The output is set. So you're finding a set. The question is, how do you define this set? You're finding all those x. x is the element of this output set. You're finding all those x such that, this means as such that, for any y from b, for any value in y in b, There exists a pair of x, y, in A. That's what you're doing. Right? Can I see a lot of puzzle face? I mean, go over this. What you're trying to find is all such x, such that for any value of y in B, there is, there is at least one pair of x, y in the instance of A. To interpret it under this context, for every project in B, there is a record in A showing that student works on that project. At least one. At least one record. Maybe multiple, that's fine. I don't care. But there should be at least one. And this must be true for any one of B. Not for some one, but for all of the y values in B. OK? So that's this. So far, so good. And there are a couple of really important notes. By writing like this, by defining A divided by B as such, what does it tell us? What's the schema of the output? That's the first question I want to ask you guys. What's the schema of the output? Is the schema A or is the schema B or is the schema something else? What's the schema of the output? Question number one. What's the schema of A divided by B? By looking at this, what's the schema of A divided by B? It cannot be A, it cannot be B because x, y, the schema of this pair is A. Is the schema of A. Uh, x, y together form a well-defined record with respect to A, meaning that x, y together covers all attributes in the schema of A. So x, which is the final output, is a subset of attributes in A. A subset 
of attributes in A in the schema of A, to be precise. Right? Because A means both the schema and the instance. I'm only referring to the schema of, of A. A subset of those attributes in the schema of A who are not in the schema of B. Those are the attributes in the output of division. Okay, looking at our example, the output schema is what? If those subset of attributes of A, A is student number and product number, that are not in the schema of B, the schema of B, in this case, very simple, is product number. So the output schema must be student number. Sorry for that. It must be student number. Do you follow this? The reason why? Okay, that's the, the first observation. The, the first question. The second question, is there any any constraint on the schema of A and B in order to do A divided by B? Meaning that before you can even start with A divided by B, are there any implicit constraints you need to satisfy in order for this operator to be well defined? Go, go ahead. Yes, the, the schema of the denominator, not the instance, the, the schema of the denominator must be a subset of the, the, the schema of the numerator. Why is that? Because you're looking for any value of b, it must be, there must be a pair x, y, a, so the schema of y must be a subset of the schema of a, which means the schema of b must be a subset of the schema of a. In other words, the schema of A must be a superset of schema of B. Henceforth, when you say A divided by B, in this case makes sense, but if I change the schema of B to product number, and why well, I don't know, the cost of each product. And in this case, if I do A divided by B, it doesn't make sense. Why it doesn't make sense? By looking at this definition, even without looking at the instance of A, by looking at just a schema of A, which only has student number, product number, I know there's no such thing in A will have contain product number and cost. No way. There, there are no cost to begin with in A. It doesn't make sense. Fantastic, okay? So those two questions are really important to remember, okay? Those two questions are really, really important to remember. Do you all follow the discussion so far? Next, the final task. The final task. How do I produce that? If all the x, for any y in b, there exists x, y in a. Okay, that's what I want to do. But how do I? Translate this to a function of A, B, selection, production, set difference, union, and uh, cross. How do I express this as a function of this guy? Basic operators. Okay? <coughs> do you all follow what I'm saying? Uh, in order to do this, I will introduce some notations, okay? Introduce some notations. I use x and y, right? So I will say, this is small x. I use small letter x and y. I use capital letter x, capital letter y, to denote the schema of A, and this is the schema of B. So, 
So x and y are not necessarily just a single attribute, it's a set of attributes. So I view A as two parts, x and y. Y is the schema of B, x is whatever remains after you take away those attributes in B, in B's schema. So this x and y are different from this small x and y. These are values, these are attributes, capital X and Y. Okay, do you all follow, follow what I'm saying? Now what I will do in the following, I will put that out all this x from A, I mean I'll take the values of these guys, the values of these guys, and I will cross that with C, meaning that I'll cross with Y. So what's the schema of this, by the way? The schema of this becomes X and Y. The schema of this, right? And what do they give me, by the way? For each x value in A, for each distinct value of x, because projection remove duplicates. So they give me a list of distinct x values in A. For every such distinct value of x in A, I pair with all possible value of y in B. That's what I get. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes or no? Like looking at this example, if I put that out student number of A cross with B, what do I get? Cross with B1, what do I get? Let's say B2. B2 is probably the way. What do I get? Someone tell me. What do I get? I got S1, P2, S1, P4, S2, P2, S2, P4. As 3 P2, as 3 P4, and as, uh, I have no space, but I got all the possible pairs between all students and projects of my interest. That's what I got. Do you follow what I'm saying so far? Yes? Okay, that's the first step in my construction. Okay, the projection of x of a cross b. Now I will use this minus away a. What do I get? I get rid of those x y pairs that actually has already appeared in the instance of a. What's remained after this is those x values and y value combinations is those x and y value combinations that do not exist in the instance of A. But you want them to exist. However, they do not exist. For example, you want student, for example, as an example, you want student 2 to work on project 4, but unfortunately in the original instance of A, student 2 does not work for project 4. So you get those pairs that you want, that are desirable, but do not actually exist. And you put out those x now, what do you get? Those are the x who do not satisfy your query condition. For example, student 2 did not work on product 4. So using this example, if I minus away a, what do I get? In this case, what do I get? S1P2 is eliminated, S1P4 exists, eliminated, S2P2 eliminated, exists in A, S2P4 will survive because I have no S2P4 in the original instance of A, S3P2 eliminated, S3P4 will survive, S4P2 eliminated, S4P4 eliminated. So I got this as my output. Now if I put that out X out of this, what do I get? I got S2 and S3. Now we're almost done. You got those X values who you want them to work on product 2 and product 4, but you find out that they actually do not work for those products. But what you want is those who actually work for product 2 and product 4. What do you do? You take all the possible X, subtract over this guy. That's it. So that's the final step. You call this disqualified X values. And you take all possible x values, which is s1, 2, 3, 4, minus those disqualified ones. 
You got the answer. Okay? So the total construction in the end is here, production of x out of a minus over this. This whole thing gave you a divided by b. And what's cool about this construction is it's independent of the instance of b. That's the key observation. If you think about the earlier construction I showed you using selection and projection, that construction depends on the instance of B. I have two products, you have to have you have to have two equivalent conditions. If I have four products, you have to have four equivalent conditions. If I have a million products, you have to have a million equivalent conditions. Does that make sense? The construction is dependent on the specific instance of B. This construction, however, is free of that independence. Meaning that you look, even if you have a million products, fine. I no longer need to worry about writing down a million condition in my query construction. That's the key difference of the two. Do you, all, do you guys all follow this? OK, that's the beta. Good news, there's nothing else coming after this will dwarf this. Okay, so if you understand this, you're almost good to go. Almost, why is it almost? Because this is just a single operator. Now imagine you have to put all these things we discussed so far together to construct complex curves. That's essentially the first part of your homework too. Uh, actually, homework two is loaded today. Sorry. Homework three, that's good. Yes, homework two is all about relation algebra, okay, which I will release on Monday but right after the due time of homework one. Okay, uh, I'm not done yet. Don't pack up yet, I have three minutes. So I'm gonna draw some examples. So these are <coughs> the sailors reserve and club stuff, right? So let's, you know, we learned a lot of, you know, we got a lot of new, new weapons today in the arsenal, right? Let's put them to use. You build a lot of weapons, you don't never use them, it's like never build them in the first place. Right? Let's use them. Let's use those weapons. Find the name of sailor who reserve both miles three. Find the name of sailors who reserve both miles three. So these are the schema and the instances. By the way, when constructing your query, right, I show these instances to help you understand the concept behind the construction of that query. These instances are not there for you to write your query against. Because you query needs to work for any possible valid instances, not just for this particular instance. What do I mean by that? Find the sailor who reserve one or three. If you look at this, you will say, oh, that's easy. One or three then, uh, is, sailor is uh, 58. So you write a query like this. You say, okay, you want to find the set of one or three, right? That's easy. Select name equal to rusty on sales. You say that's my query. Does it work in this particular instance? Does it work in this particular instance? Yes, it does. But I may, after you write this query, I may change my instance. Sailor 31, lover, also reserved. Both miles three. Then your query no longer works. Do you follow my intuition? This is the wrong way of constructing any query. You should never write a query like this. Okay? The right way of constructing a query is to write a query such that it works in all possible scenarios. No matter how users change their instances. So how do we write this query? One last minute. You, you naturally want to reserve on sailors, and then you select those records with both ID equal one or three, you print out the sailor name. Solution one, so that's, that's one solution. Another solution is, before you do the natural join of reserve on sailors, you only care about those reservation records from the reserve on sailor on both one or three. So you say, okay, I'm gonna narrow down my reservation record to only those reservation records concerning both one or three. That natural draw with sailors, that tell me those sailors who actually reserve this, because natural draw happened on 
Sila Ali value, which you call the values, meaning I'm talking about those sitter who made those reservation records. Then I put the sitter name. Comparing the two, the output is the same, which is more efficient. Top one is more efficient, right? Because cross product is expensive. By narrowing down the possible records involving in the cross product, you improve the efficiency of query dramatically. But that's the point I, I was talking about at the beginning of the semester. Database system, you as the database administrator or user, you actually don't have to worry about this detail. You can write a solution to most likely the underlying database system will convert your query automatically to solution one using something called query optimizer, which we will be talking about, talking about that just a little bit. And the last point I want to make is, remember at the beginning of today's lecture, I said relational algebra is operational. Sorry about that. Really sorry. Is relational algebra is operational? This is demonstrated using these two examples. Not only relational algebra can tell you what you want, but the way you construct your relational algebra queries actually tells you how you are executing your query. So it's very efficient. With that, I'll stop here. See you on Monday.